Okay, our first talk will be an intro to transfusion medicine and transfusion reactions, part one. So, the intro to transfusion medicine will basically talk about the scope of transfusion medicine, just as an overview. Some basic immunology. I'm not trying to make you an immunologist, but these are just the essentials that you'll need to know before we talk about an acute and delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. The blood types, the compatibility rules, and finally, a little bit on the lab testing that we do in the blood bank. Then we'll move on to the first part of transfusion reactions. We'll have two total parts. The first part, we'll talk about acute and delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. The two most common types of transfusion reactions, febrile, non-hemolytic, and allergic, and the most extreme version of allergic, an anaphylactic reaction. And every now and then I'll throw in a few cat or dog photos just to keep you awake, just to take the edge off the, the litany. So what is transfusion medicine? The way I think about it is no matter what size of a blood bank, no matter what size of a transfusion service operation you have, you have to have blood products, right? And if you have blood products, you need to have the corresponding lab tests that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then you always have a medical director of the lab, so you could always ask that medical director some questions, whether you're in a private practice setting or in academics. And depending on the size of the transfusion medicine operation, particularly in academic settings, you often have therapeutic apheresis as part of the operation. What's not listed here is what's another common component, which is a blood donor center. So in many large operations, there's also a donor center. In some cases, there's a donor center that's separate from a hospital service. So what are the blood products that we use in the blood bank? There are two ways you could donate blood. That's either via whole blood in this uh, diagram or apheresis. You could donate one unit, one type of blood product uh, at a time. So the whole blood method, you just fill up a bag of blood, usually about 500 mLs of, of whole blood, and then you centrifuge that in a so-called soft spin, and then the bottom of that is the red cells, and then the supernatant is platelet-rich plasma. Then if you spin this again, the so-called hard spin, then the bottom of that will be platelets, and then you could pull those together. Usually four to six of those whole blood-derived platelets can make one adult dose. And then the supernatant is plasma, and then you can freeze, uh, you could pull and freeze the plasma. And then, to make cryoprecipitate, you just take frozen plasma and then put that from the freezer into the refrigerator. So, take frozen plasma and put that in the refrigerator to make cryoprecipitate. The main ingredient of cryoprecipitate is fibrinogen. If it were up to me, I would just change the name of this product that we call cryoprecipitate and just change it to fibrinogen. Because sure, cryoprecipitate describes the manufacturing process, take frozen plasma and then the fibrinogen and a few other things precipitate in the refrigerator, but we call red cells, red cells, platelets, platelets, and plasma, plasma, why not call fibrinogen, fibrinogen? But it's crap precipitate for now. And then when you centrifuge that crap precipitate, the bottom of that is this mainly fibrinogen crap precipitate, and then the top of that is essentially plasma minus the fibrinogen, also known as cryoprecipitate reduced plasma. And then of course you could donate by apheresis, right? You could go to the donor center and use an apheresis machine and just donate red cells or just donate platelets, just donate plasma, things like that. But so our main blood products are red cells, plasma, platelets, and cryo. So you may have seen these if you've been in the blood bank already. Um, if you haven't, go in there. Red cells, platelets and plasma, you store red cells in the refrigerator, platelets at room temp on the, the shimmy shimmy agitator, and then plasma in the freezer. What is the point of these blood products? Red cells we use for oxygenation, platelets for primary hemostasis, making a platelet plug at sites of endothelial injury, plasma, basically your coag factors, secondary hemostasis, meaning we want to produce fibrin a fibrin clot as the end point. The way I think about it is the platelets are like the bricks and the fibrinogen is like the uh, cement that keeps the bricks in place. And then cryo is mainly for fibrinogen. So fibrinogen or cryo is often used as an adjunct 
So you're already giving the patient, in most cases, um, you're already giving the patient uh, plasma and you're giving cryo for additional fibrinogen because that can get used up very quickly. Grumpy Cat, if you haven't seen the Grumpy Cat Christmas movie, check it out. It's not your typical Christmas movie. It's good times. So basic immunology, right? I like simple figures. I like simple ways to think about things. So the immune system basically has a humoral response or antibody mediated response and a cellular response, right? So immunologists in the crowd don't cringe. This is how I think about it. And so when you have a foreign body that you recognize, then you have a macrophage or other antigen presenting cell that guess what? Presents the antigen to your CD4 positive helper T cell. And what the helper T cell does is two main things. One, it tells your killer T cells to activate. We're not really gonna talk about that side of it much because it's not terribly relevant uh, to what we do in blood banking in the laboratory. Mainly what we do is serology. So we deal with antibodies, right? Antibodies and antigens. The other thing that the helper, helper T cell does is it tells B cells, hey, uh, mature into plasma cells and make antibodies against this foreign body, right? And the antibodies that are made are initially IgM primarily, and then over time, gradually IgG. To some degree, we have IgA I, and tiny amounts of IgE and very tiny amounts of IgD, okay? So don't freak out. This is a little busy, but we don't need the whole figure. The main point that I'm making is you have a mature B cell that we saw at the bottom of that other figure, right? And then in the blood, that's where the antigen presenting cell interacts with the B cell and tells it to turn into plasma cells, right? We already covered that. So what this is illustrating is a few more things. One thing it's illustrating is in this process, not only do you make plasma cells, but you also make memory B cells, right? Memory B cells. So you can remember in the future that you've made antibodies to this foreign antigen before. Number one. And number two, it shows that you make, again, primarily IgM initially. And then you also end up making IgGs primarily after that. And then IgA to some degree. And then a tiny, tiny amount of IgE. So you make essentially all types of the isotypes of antibodies for each antigen that you encounter, right? Every time you do this response, you make all of them. And when we move along to talk about the primary versus secondary response, we alluded to this a little bit. If you look at time and then immunoglobulin concentration, we said before that when you first see this foreign antigen, it's predominantly IgM. That is the primary response, right? And then a little bit after that, IgG. And you use this sometimes in um, infectious disease, that if you see a positive IgM against that infectious agent, then that's evidence that there was a recent exposure, right? So this is evidence of recent exposure. Similar concept here. And then if you see this antigen again, then the secondary response is different in a few ways, right? It's different in that you'll get to the IgG faster, so it's a faster response overall, number one. Number two, you make more. So you make a higher titer of IgG and you have a higher affinity. And the reason for the higher affinity is because in the meantime, in your lymph nodes, you've gone through a somatic hypermutation to basically fine tune the antibodies that will go against this foreign antigen. So you certainly have some IgM again when, you're, when you respond the second time and third time and subsequent times, but it's primarily IgG. This very same chart will come in handy later on when we talk about delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. If you could understand how a secondary response happens, then you essentially understand delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. And so if you put those two figures together, right, we saw this, this is antibodies, antibody concentration versus time, and then the primary response, initially IgM with some lag time, and then later IgG then the secondary response is faster, higher, tighter, greater affinity, right? The reason for that is the memory B cells, right? The memory B cells, you didn't have them in the primary response, right? It's completely new to you, but you did have the memory B cells for your second and subsequent responses. That's why it's different. 
memory B cells. Okay, and then what am I trying to say here? Different types, right? Different phenotypes. I try to connect the cat picture or the dog picture with the concept we're about to introduce. Sometimes it's cute and I'm successful. Other times it's corny. Other times I can't do it at all. I do the best I can. So, blood types. I'm gonna go quickly through this because you probably already know this by now. So, you could have on the red cells either the A antigen, the B antigen, both or neither to be type A, B, A, B, or O respectively. And then you make the anti-A or the anti-B against the antigen that you lack. So if you're type A, you lack the B antigen, so guess what, you make anti-B. If you're type B, you lack the A antigen, so you make anti-A. If you're type AB, you don't like either one, so you don't make either anti-A or anti-B. If you're type O, you lack both antigens, so you naturally make anti-A and anti-B, and also some IgG anti-A comma B, which can recognize either the A antigen or the B antigen. And for unclear reasons, these remain IgM. So it's the ABO system is a little bit weird in that the anti-B, for example, if you're type A, remains IgM primarily over time. So it's an exception to the rule that a primary response is IgM and then the secondary response is mainly IgG. People hypothesize that perhaps gut flora is the, kind of like the continuous stimulation uh, of this so that you always make anti-B or anti-A because there's via molecular mimicry something on gut flora that looks kind of like these antigens. But it's not completely clear why we make these antibodies. And then for compatibility, because of these anti-A's and anti-B antibodies, the main concept here is we're trying to prevent an anti-A getting together with an A antigen, it's cognate antigen, and we're trying to prevent an anti-B from getting together with the B antigen. So if that were to happen, God forbid, that would be an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. So if you could remember that concept, then you could reason through the rest of this, right? So just think about for a red cell transfusion, the excess of antibody is in the recipient. Right, the excess of antibody is in the recipient, and the bag of red cells is the source of antigens. Right, so if you think about, okay, I'm a type O recipient. What red cells can I get? Well, I can only get my own type. I can only get type O. The reason for that is because I make anti A and anti B, so I can't see the A or B antigen. Certainly not both. That's why the arrows point this way, not that way. If you're type A, you make anti B. Right, so I'm a patient with anti-B, so I can't see the B antigen. Don't infuse that patient with B antigen, so they can't get B or AB. But they can safely get A, their own type, and they can safely get O, because O has no B antigen. And then similarly, if you're a type B patient, you make anti-A, so you can't see type A red cells or AB red cells, but you can't see O, okay? And of course, you could be infused with your own type, so Type Bs can get B red cells and O red cells. Finally, at AB recipient, you don't make either anti-A nor anti-B, so you can get any red cells, right? You can get any A or B antigen or neither. It's no problem because you don't have either the, the anti-A or the anti-B. And then for the advanced crowd, if you're thinking about plasma, the excess of antigen is in the recipient, and the excess of antibody, relatively, I mean, the, the, the bag of plasma is a, is a bag of antibodies. So all these arrows are reversed, meaning if you have a bag of O plasma, that bag, right, has anti-A and anti-B. And so you wouldn't want to infuse that into anybody that had an A or B antigen. So all these arrows on the red cell chart are reversed for a plasma chart. All right, so there's more to the red cell than just ABO. Not to freak you out, but there's more than just ABO. And it's not worth knowing the exact chemical structures of the antigens. I mean, broadly speaking, uh, the ABOs and Lewis's are carbohydrates just on the surface of the red cell, whereas essentially 
all the other red cell antigens are proteins, transmembrane proteins. But it's not worth knowing more beyond that. I only bring this up because acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, we're worried about ABL compatibility for delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions that are, as we'll see, less um, severe, but certainly worth preventing if we can. Those involve non-ABO antibodies, or antibodies to non-ABO antigens, right? Primarily IgG, as we'll see. Okay, moving on to lab testing. So compatibility testing involves a few different lab tests. So you could order an ABO type, and we'll get into the recipe of how you do that. And it's worth remembering the recipes for each of these lab tests because if you could remember what exactly we're mixing together, what few things are being combined, then you could reason through the rest, okay? So an ABO type is just a description. It tells you the patient's O positive, the patient's A negative, you know, what A and B antigens do they have? Do they have the D antigen or not? And then what anti-A and anti-B antibodies do they make? That's one lab test, the type. Another one is the antibody screen. We'll get into that in some detail. That's basically answering the question, is the patient making antibodies to non-ABO antigens? Antibodies to non-ABO antigens. Then in our testing algorithm here, if the antibody screen ends up being negative, then all we need to worry about is the ABO and D compatibility for a red cell product. If, however, the antibody screen is positive, either today or historically, if we need to respect an old, previously known about antibody, then we'll go from the screen, which is usually just two or three cells, into a panel, which usually involves several, <coughs> several red cells. And then the end point of that will be that we find the specificity of the antibody. Now we know, okay, the patient has anti, say, JKB. So the patient has anti-JKB, and then the whole point of doing that is we want to make sure we give the patient an antigen negative red cell, meaning a unit that is negative for, in that case, the JKB antigen. So if it's a clinically significant antibody, we want to res respect it, the, the term is we respect that antibody by giving the patient antigen negative red cells. Then whichever path we took to get to the cross match, then we'll do the cross match, as we'll see in more detail, the cross match is specific to one unit of red cells. So we're taking a little bit of the volume of those red cells that we're about to issue, and we mix that with a little bit of plasma from the recipient. And it's kind of like an in vitro transfusion. We're trying to make sure that there's not going to be any problems before we issue that unit. Then if everything works out, everything is compatible in the cross match, then we'll issue the red cell product. So to summarize, the basic menu of testing is we have a type that tells you is the patient A positive, O negative, and so on. What A and B antigens do they have? A and B antibodies, and do they have the D antigen or not? Then the antibody screen, does the patient's plasma have non-ABO antibodies? Do they have antibodies to non-ABO antigens? That if one of those antibodies is clinically significant, then we'll respect it with antigen negative units. And then finally, the cross match, that's answering the question, okay, is this patient's plasma compatible with a specific unit of red cells? And that's particular to one unit that we're about to issue. And in the red cell antibodies talks, we'll go into much more detail about all this, but for now, the main point is that all these lab tests, the main purpose is to prevent an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction in the case of ABL compatibility and also to prevent a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction in the case of the antibody screen, because it's non-ABO antibodies. And what is this picture about? Different kinds of reactions. I, I told you some of them would be corny, different kinds of reactions. So moving on to transfusion reactions. We'll talk about acute and delayed hemolytic, febrile, allergic, and finally anaphylactic reactions. So acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, it's almost always due to an incompatibility with ABO system. Very rarely you'll see case reports of an IgG that causes this outside the ABO system. It's usually because that IgG happens to strongly activate complement. But those are very rare. Almost always due to a red cell transfusion, but again, sometimes you could see it with platelet and plasma transfusions. 
and roughly 5% of ABO incompatible transfusions end up being fatal. So God forbid you encounter an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction or you suspect it. The main thing to remember here why I bring this up is that it's not necessarily going to end badly. Keep your wits about you, treat it as we'll go into, and then in most cases, the patient will make it through it as long as you're diligent. And then roughly one in one and a half million total transfusions end up being fatal due to an ABO incompatible bread cell transfusion. So I bring this up just to illustrate the point that it's very rare. I've never seen one, thankfully, um, and I hope never to see one. So why is this a problem? Why is it that when you get together, let's say an anti-A antibody and an A antigen, why is this so bad? The reason this is so bad is when you have this, say, anti-A and cognate antigen, the A antigen, the problem here is that you have that IgM that strongly activates complement, right? The IgM anti-A, in this case, strongly activates complement. And when we say strongly activates complement, we mean all the way to C9, all the way to the membrane attack complex that pokes holes in the transfused red cells. So that causes a brisk hemolysis, though brisk hemolysis is bad news. Why is it bad news? Free hemoglobin is the main culprit, okay? Free hemoglobin, it's worth remembering, that's the main trouble. All these broken up transfused red cells have liberated the hemoglobin that was inside them, and now this free hemoglobin can bind to nitric oxide. It could bind up your nitric oxide, and then why is that bad? That's bad because it, you could be relatively vasoconstricted. You have less ability to vasodilate. And then the kidneys are most sensitive to this. You could see acute renal failure and worst case, multi-organ failure and death. So that's, in my opinion, the main culprit, but there are other bad factors at work. One is that all these broken up pieces of red cells, they don't help the kidneys, right? And they don't help the small vessels. They don't help blood flow through them all the busted up pieces of red cells, number one. And number two, these busted up pieces of red cells, many of the surfaces have a negative charge. And a negative charge can rev up via your contact factors, can rev up your intrinsic pathway, your intrinsic coagulation pathway. And so that could lead to, worst case, a DIC type picture. And also file in your brain under brisk hemolysis for any reason. Right? It doesn't just have to be an immune cause. It could be mechanical, right? It could be infectious. It could be chemical. Any kind of brisk hemolysis, I get nervous about the free hemoglobin and the same um, final common pathway in any etiology of a brisk hemolysis. So what can you see in a patient with an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction? Well, the first signs are usually a fever and or a chill. I say and or because if a patient has a chill without a temperature increase, I consider that synonymous. So you can have a febrile reaction without a fever. You know, don't freak out. And they can have rigors, anxiety, flushing, pain in different sites, sometimes nausea, vomiting, dyspnea. The blood pressure can go up or down. Um, hemoglobinuria, sometimes worst case. The kidneys just shut down and you have oliguria or just anuria, no urine output at all. And if there's DIC at work, diffuse bleeding, diffuse, diffuse oozing, um, especially at the puncture sites in the patient. So the main thing to keep in mind is this is dose dependent, right? Five mLs of incompatible red cells is bad, 10 is worse, 20 is worse still. So that's why we freak out about if you're considering a transfusion reaction, even the possibility of one, just stop it as soon as possible. And then it's okay to be wrong, and it turns out the patient wasn't having a reaction, but it's worth stopping. So that's easy money on any kind of test that you take. If that is an option, if someone's having a suspected transfusion reaction, and they have not yet stopped the transfusion, guess what? Stop it. And if the patient can't talk to you, sometimes uh, you'll see in the OR, Hypotension is usually more common than hypertension. Oozing, again, at the puncture sites. And if there is a catheter in dark or red urine, it's unexplained.
And then if you suspect an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, what should you do? Well, sooner rather than later, and it's okay to be wrong in retrospect. If you suspect this, then you should make sure the patient is getting bolus saline and diuretics, right? The whole point here is to keep the kidneys working, keep the patient peeing. And supportive care if they need it, for example, pressure support, if they're in DIC, these kinds of things. And then that's the treatment is first, right? First things last, do that first. And then the workup, what we're gonna do is initially gonna be the same for any kind of reaction. As we'll see in the blood bank, we treat any kind of suspected transfusion reaction the same initially. We could always do more after the initial steps, but initially we're trying to rule out an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. So how do we do that? We always, always, always do three things. And then once we do this in the blood bank, the blood bank will call the resident and say, our blood bank workup is negative, meaning all this is normal, or they have some abnormal findings. The three things we always do are the clerical check, which is basically making sure that the right unit was transfused to the right patient. A DAT, a direct antiglobulin test, that's basically answering the question, is there an immune process that is affecting the patient sample red cells? And I say patient sample red cells because in a transfused situation, a post-transfusion situation, the, the patient sample may not be just the, nat the patient's native red cells. There might be some transfused red cells admixed with the patient's own. So patient sample red cells. And finally, a hemolysis check. And this is just a visual check. We just take the post-transfusion tube, the post-transfusion sample, centrifuge it, and then look at the color of the plasma. If it's normal appearing, that's reassuring that there's no brisk hemolysis for any reason, whether it's mechanical, infectious, chemical, or immune. But if it's dark or if it's red, if it's abnormal colored plasma, that's not confirmation by any means that there is a particular etiology. And that's not even confirmation that there's brisk hemolysis in the patient because it could have been a hemolyzed sample during phlebotomy. But the main thing is, if it's normal, that's reassuring. And then if DAT is negative, that's reassuring. There's no immune process affecting the patient sample red cells. And the clerical check will tell us that there was no oopsie either at the bedside in the blood bank or at any point during the pre-analytical and pre-transfusion process, right? And if any of these are positive or abnormal, then we could always repeat the ABO typing, repeat the antibody screen uh, or the cross match, and we could always continue on with more tests as needed. For example, if we wanted to add on a haptoglobin to see if the patient is hemolyzing, or if we wanted to add on any kind of chemistries to see how the patient's kidneys are doing, these kinds of things. Oh, yes. So now we're going to talk about delayed, yes, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. So remember this. We have, again, the antibody titer and time and the primary versus the secondary response, right? So it's basically the same picture. You have your primary response. When you're first exposed to this, you make some antibodies slowly, initially IgM, then IgG, right? And then when you encounter the same antigen again, then you have the secondary response. What I'm illustrating here is that on the one hand, most commonly, if we do an antibody screen here, right, right before this transfusion, let's say you're negative for the JKB antigen, and then this red cell is positive for the JKB antigen, and then this causes an immune response, okay? And we do an antibody screen here, and that antibody screen is negative. You're not making any anti-JKB at the time. You haven't been transfused yet, okay? Then what usually happens in most cases is that if we come in here and do an antibody screen at any point after you make the antibody, the antibody screen will be positive, right? That's kind of the whole point of the antibody screen. The antibody screen will be positive and we'll find the anti-JKB. But sometimes, rarely, this happens some of these antibodies can drop so low, their antibody titer can drop so low that essentially there's no antibody to be detected, right? And if we do an antibody screen at that point, 
the antibody screen will be negative, right? It's not a lab mistake, right? It's not a false negative. It's a true negative in that at that moment, the patient has no antibody to detect because the anti-JKB essentially dipped to a zero or very close to zero titer. And it's, um, this antibody titer is below the limit of detection of our antibody screen. Again, this is rare. It happens, I'm roughly guessing, less than, much less than 1% of the time. But the trouble here is that we in the blood bank, if this is happening, all we know is there's a negative antibody screen here and a negative antibody screen here. So we have no reason to give the patient any special kinds of blood, right? We have no reason to give the patient JKB negative blood. We don't know about their anti-JKB antibody. So we might unintentionally, you know, we're not trying to give JKB positive units, but we might coincidentally issue the patient a JKB positive unit and the secondary response can result. The patient could have a secondary response and then a delayed transfusion, excuse me, a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction over the next roughly three to 14 days. And the reason for this is what? Is because the patient is infused with all these JKB positive red cells and then over several days, the antibody titer increases, right? The antibody titer increases all these IgG anti-JKBs <coughs> start chewing up and slowly hemolyzing these transfused red cells, and that leads to a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. And what kinds of antibodies cause a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction? The number one most common is KID antibodies, and number two, Duffy. Really, any IgG can do this. And the treatment, usually we don't need to treat a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, worst case, we could retransfuse them with some red cells that are now antigen negative because we know about the antibody. And we could always offer the patient include this antibody information in their health history. Just like with allergies and medications, they could include, I have anti-JKB. So if they're in another hospital, they could respect that. And then there's a term called delayed serologic transfusion reaction. That just means this has the same exact findings as a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, but no hemolysis. Then moving on to febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. And when we say fever, we usually mean a one degree Celsius increase and or a chill, right? Again, if I see a chill and I don't have a temperature increase at all, or even a temperature increase that's at least one degree Celsius, that's okay. I consider them equivalent because it's the same pathophysiology at work. And this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You could have a fever in many different transfusion reactions and in many different conditions. So just because you see a fever, don't miss another kind of transfusion reaction. Don't just stop at the fever. Continue to look at other signs and symptoms. And why do these happen? The going hypothesis is that cytokines accumulate during storage because white blood cells uh, die off during storage and liberate these substances. And one good piece of evidence for that is because now that blood products are leuco reduced, the incidence has gone way down, but it's not down to zero. So there are probably other mechanisms at work. And the problem, meaning what's annoying, is that if the patient starts out with a fever or a chill, then at that moment in time, we're not sure, is this just a nuisance, febrile, non hemolytic transfusion reaction, or is this an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, or is this another kind of transfusion reaction that has fever or chill as part of the clinical manifestations? So at that moment in time, we, sure, in the back of our head, we're probably thinking, you know what, this is probably just this, a nuisance febrile reaction, or this could even be the patient's own fever, the patient's own medical condition that can cause regular fevers, regular temperature increases. But at that moment in time, we're not certain. So in general, we tell clinicians that, okay, if you see a fever or a chill, then err on the side of caution and stop the transfusion. Don't push through it if you see a fever or a chill. And more broadly, we say you should probably stop the transfusion if you see any vital sign changes. And of course, if the patient is reporting any symptoms, again, stop the transfusion.
And so how do we prevent febrile reactions? Well, leukoreduction reduction has gone a long way. We look at reduce red cells and uh, platelets. We don't look at reduce granulocytes. That's blood bank humor, sorry. And if the patient has a history of this, then we could premedicate with an antipyretic like Tylenol. And also treat, you could treat the same way with something like Tylenol, Demerol, to get rid of the fever. Moving on to, yes, allergic. Uh, I bring this up because one of our previous residents, Selena, was violently allergic to cats. Guess what? She had a cat. An allergic transfusion reaction is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, right? And so the allergen will bind to IgE, IgE on mast cells, and that will tell your mast cells to release histamine. So you can see a rash, which can be variable from mild and localized to moderate to severe. Severe meaning ballpark, more than 25% of the body surface area is covered. Worst case, head to toe coverage in uh, severe reactions. Urticaria, hives, and then pruritus, which is just fancy for itching, even without a visible skin manifestation. Speaking of itching. And you could prevent these with in a roughly increasing order of severity Benadryl, also known as diphenhydramine, a short-acting IV steroid, dexamethasone, or in some cases, prednisone. That would be reserved for, for example, a patient is getting plasma exchange and we're using several units of plasma per day and the patient is reacting relatively moderately to all of them. Those meds can be used for prevention or for treatment and supportively if need be. Anaphylactic transfusion reactions. So anaphylactic transfusion reactions it usually manifest as an immediate shock, you know, a severe drop in blood pressure on their first transfusion. And this will hopefully make more sense when we're finished talking. You can certainly have random anaphylactic transfusion reactions, but this is the most common way I've seen it is that on the patient's first ever transfusion, they go into immediate shock, immediate meaning after just a few mLs of the offending blood product. And hypotension, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 over 30, something really severe is common. And some degree of respiratory distress, it could be laryngeal, meaning tightness or dysphagia, or pulmonary, meaning dyspnea or hypoxemia. And you may or may not see skin manifestations. So in my mind, this is slightly different manifestations compared to an anaphylactic reaction versus, you know, an anaphylactic transfusion reaction versus anaphylactic reaction that you would see to a drug or a shrimp or peanuts, um, bee stings. In those cases, you almost always see skin manifestations, but you don't always see it, the skin manifestations in an anaphylactic transfusion reaction. And what they need as treatment is epinephrine ASAP. So they need epinephrine as soon as you suspect this, and this will, and in most cases, alleviate the signs and symptoms. And then the most common cause of an anaphylactic transfusion reaction is IgA deficiency. So IgA deficiency. And when I say IgA deficiency to a blood banker, I am distinguishing what we mean from what the typical allergist or immunologist means. What they're concerned with primarily is if a patient has low, very low IgA, then they're prone to infections, right? What we mean by IgA deficiency is the patient has zero IgA because that's the only way, really, you're going to make antibodies to IgA, and that's generally the only way you're going to have those antibodies cause an anaphylactic transfusion reaction. So just to be clear, IgA deficiency is the number one cause of anaphylactic transfusion reactions in the US and in Europe. Um, and nothing stops you from having an anaphylactic transfusion reaction just randomly, even if you have IgA. So this is the most common cause, but not the only cause. And then in Japan, as some trivia uh, haptoglobin deficiency is the most common cause. So how do we determine this, right? So after the patient has had an anaphylactic transfusion reaction, we've treated them with epinephrine, they've stabilized, everything's okay. Then we first start with just an IgA level in-house. Just do simple nephilometry in your hospital lab as the first test. 
And if you see some IgA there, then you can stop because guess what? It's not IgA deficiency. But if the test result is lower than the lower limit of detection, you know, undetectable by that test, that doesn't mean they have zero necessarily. It just means whatever they have is lower than the lower limit of their detection. So what we do second, only if that's below the limit of detection, is then we do a specialized test that has a much lower, lower limit of detection. And that's usually in the neighborhood of 0 0.05 milligrams per deciliter. And that's usually a reference lab test. And we send it there. And if that result is undetectable, then we can stamp the patient truly IgA deficient to a blood banker. And then usually in those same labs, the same specialty labs, they also look for antibodies against IgA. And so they'll usually find an IgG against IgA, keeping in mind that the actual anaphylaxis is caused by IgE, right? IgE is an echo, but we can't really go testing for IgE echo because it's in such tiny quantities. But because we remember immunology from before, when you make an antibody to an antigen, you make all the isotypes, right? So essentially, we're using the IgG anti-IgA as a surrogate for the IgE. Does that make sense? Okay. Then, if you find these anti-IgA antibodies, that explains the anaphylactic transfusion reaction or if you use this prospectively in advance of transfusion, it will, it will, it's a good predictor that they will have an anaphylactic transfusion reaction. And so how can we prevent this, right? We can prevent this by washing the red cells or washing the platelets. What is washing? It has nothing to do with soap. What we do is we'll take saline and, and run it through the bag of red cells, usually two or three times. It takes at least an hour to do. And the whole point here so we're trying to remove the plasma, right? We want to remove the plasma because that's where the IgA is. The red cells are okay, generally, and the platelets are okay, generally. So I've never heard of a washed red cell or platelet causing an anaphylactic transfusion reaction. It may have happened, but I just haven't heard about it. So on the one hand, it's a pretty effective prevention strategy. Um, on the other hand, I don't know if I would say that it's a 100% guarantee that an anaphylactic transfusion reaction simply can't happen. Because you could argue, well, there could be some IgA just stuck onto a red cell or stuck onto a platelet. Or the washing process is perhaps not perfect. Sure. But in my mind, it's as, as good as gold. It's, it's a pretty good strategy. And then if you need plasma, right, well, you can't wash a bag of plasma because then that would just be a bag of saline. So what you would need to do is find IgA deficient donors. So you need, you need to ask the rare donor network or ask around in, or among your blood centers, do you have any IgA deficient plasma? Sometimes you may find a handful of units locally. More commonly, if you need a lot of plasma, for example, in advance of a liver transplant and the patient's IgA deficient, that takes some planning and some forethought. It's not something you can snap your fingers and, and get right away. So the rare donor network that has access or has an inventory of these products, they usually require the test that we talked about on the previous slide. They require demonstrating that this patient indeed is IgA deficient using that special test with a very low limit of detection. And number two, they have anti-IgA antibodies. They will need that before they release any units that they have because it's such a scarce resource. They don't want to waste it because you can imagine this is a pretty small patient, excuse me, it's a pretty small donor population that they're completely IgA deficient yet healthy enough to be blood donors. And that's all we have for the transfusion reactions. One, don't forget to do the quiz questions to make sure that you paid attention and learned something.